Good morning, Thursday morning. The waterfall is very quiet this morning. There's not a whole lot of water coming down there. It's just a little trickle in comparison to how it has been. I hope you are well. I hope all is good today. It's beautiful. It's a gorgeous morning. Morning, Des. How you look at the waterfall? I enjoy watching your pictures of Carmichael. We're all doing our wee bit to bring some nature to people that can't see it. Hope you're well. I need to speak to you today, actually. Oh, it's beautiful, isn't it? We're so lucky where we live, Des. Huh. Man, it's gorgeous. It really is. <laughs> I honestly feel like the luckiest guy on earth when I come up here. True story. I'll give you a shout later on and we'll get a wee chat about that car. Cool. Have a great day, brother. Stay safe. Tree and the waterfall. Right. Here we go. Good morning. Hope everyone is well this morning. It's Wednesday morning. And, oh, I'm always doing that, aren't I? It's pretty, pretty uncouth of me. Anyway, this morning, um, <clears throat> I just realised, I genuinely just realised on uh, Monday night, Monday, Monday night that my sobriety from alcohol birthday is today. 14 year after the baby, 14 year after the drink the day, and um, I genuinely, truthfully, wholeheartedly had no idea that uh, my 14 year sobriety journey uh, was today. And it was whilst I was away, I was chatting to one of the guys that I was walking with and I says, aye, aye, I've no drink for about 14 years. And he goes, oh, when did you give that up? I went, eh, mm, don't remember. Uh, because what I did was I gauged it against Tea in the Park, Tea in the Park 2006. Um, and I genuinely, because there's no tea in the park going on any longer, I, I couldn't, I didn't have a frame of reference to, to gauge it against. So I then got really excited and thought, oh, wouldn't that be remarkable if um, unconsciously my 14 year sobriety journey is whilst I am walking the West Highland Way, wouldn't that be tremendous? But anyway, when I got down the road on Monday night, I googled tea in the park, the who, 2006, because I rocked up to tea in the park only to see the who and I bought myself a pint of lager to stand in the queue and watch the who and that was the last drink I ever had the very last drink of alcohol that I ever had was a half pint of horrible lager on a warm Sunday afternoon watching the who and you could hardly say that that was reaching rock bottom with my drinking but uh, the last time I was completely hammered smashed and have very little cognitive uh, remembrance of what I was doing was New Year 2005 into 2006 and that was probably the day that marked my um, rethinking my drinking. Uh, I began rethinking my drinking in 2005 into 2006 because I got myself so completely and utterly obliterated that I lost any ability um, for my impulse control and had a, an incredible outburst of very um, aggressive and uh, hideous, horrible behaviours, right? But uh, I then began rethinking my drinking and <clears throat> didn't give up alcohol until now, today, uh, Sunday the 9th of July, half pint of lager at Teen the Park, and threw the half pint away and went, that's it, I'm done, I'm done with it. So, are you, and I've, I've answered it this morning, I've wrote this morning, 14 years sobriety today, this is my 14th year birthday of um, not having any alcohol past my lips, and was I an alcoholic, was I not an alcoholic, was I an alcoholic, was I not an alcoholic, was I an alcoholic, was I not an alcoholic, um, and those kind of thoughts still come through my head and sometimes I am very centred with an ability to say I was an alcoholic and then other times I still within sobriety I go was I really an alcoholic because my drinking wasn't megaly extreme and um, 
But where I got to with my drinking was that I couldn't drink with safety. Um, I had absolutely no control over knowing who was coming out of the box after a couple of halves, right? Was it going to be Ross the funny guy? Was it going to be Ross the guy that fell asleep in the corner? Was it going to be Ross the guy that wrecked the house? Was it going to be Ross the guy that was outside jumping up and down in the neighbour's car's roof? Um, was it going to be Ross that was annoying the life out of everybody at a party? Or was it going to be Ross that was wanted to be the showman? Don't look at him, you know, and don't give him eye contact. Right, get that clown down, right? So, that's all very true. That's all real, Okay. And um, I was with my friend yesterday, uh, I'd like to call her my friend, Libby, and uh, we were having a fantastic chat and we were talking about all kinds of stuff and really, uh, for the first time I think in my life, genuinely, I've been doing these vlogs and I'm going to make them as well because I must be nearly close to a hundred and as well I had this little thing in my mind that I have definitely done more vlogs than I have subscribers to my YouTube channel and for me I find that funny I think that's funny right and I'll check them but I've done about a hundred vlogs and hand in my heart and I've thought about it and I've spoke about it in depthly with uh, people that don't let me off the hook and that hold me accountable and I set off on this I'm not trying to sell you anything I don't need you to buy a product. I'm not doing an online coaching course. This isn't like the pre-dress rehearsal for something that I'm going to at the end slip in and get you to buy off me. I don't need you to buy anything off me. And 100%, well, maybe not, nothing can be 100%, but when I started this off, I don't have any agenda other than if one person can take a belt or a noose out for in their neck, right, if one person can stop drinking, if one person can take a needle out their arm, that's my only agenda, right? Uh, hand in my heart. God is my witness today, that's what I believe. Now, yes, from this, of course I am. Then I'm getting something from it. Is it, um, is it feeding my ego at some level? Of course it is. Am I aware of that? Yes. Does that make it right or wrong? I don't know. Anyway. We're here to talk about drinking and are you rethinking your drinking? And um, now, are you rethinking? We get a signal and sometimes we don't. Right, I had to run up the hill there, so sometimes I get a signal and sometimes I don't get up here. So are you rethinking your drinking? Are you going through the thoughts that we've all went through but you think you're the only person that goes through these thoughts? That's what Libby and I were talking about yesterday. Billy Conley. Billy Conley was not a comedian. Billy Conley was a healer. Billy Conley healed people. And are you rethinking your drinking? Do you think, well, you know, well, look, there's a few people watching this, right? So what I'm going to ask you to do is just tune into your body, tune into your somatic experience, the body. And I am going to say a word to you. Love, acceptance, joy, love, right acceptance joy how does it feel in your body to hear those words love acceptance joy nature how does it feel to look at that tree that fern that greenery right how does it feel right now what i'm going to ask you is keep tuning into your body and i say the word to you alcoholic 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 Right, what does that do to your body? Now, as I'm guessing, I might be wrong, one of them was a very expansive experience and one of them was a very contractive experience. Right, one of, the, one of them you felt as if your body was opening up and one of them you felt as if your body just closed down, shut down, right? Now, that word alcoholic, it's bloody horrible. It's a horrible word. Hi, my name's Ross, I'm an alcoholic, right? It's bloody horrible, right? Um, it doesn't necessarily fit. But as you're rethinking your drinking, when you're caught in the mind of someone that has a compulsion towards drugs or alcohol, sex or gambling, it's like, well, I've not got a problem because I don't drink in the morning. And if you are drinking in the morning, you say, you know, I, know, I would never drink spirits in the morning. You know, occasionally I'll have a beer in the morning, you know, but that's okay. Or... 
you know, you're able to stop for two and three weeks at a time. Great story, love that. Right, a guy I knew about years ago, right, was definitely an alcoholic. And his wife was at him all the time, you're drinking too much, you're drinking too much, you're drinking too much. And they went away on holiday, right? They went over to France, somewhere cool. And uh, they're in France, they're on holiday. And she's bitching about him, she's bitching about, I want you to get help for your alcohol, I want you to get help for your alcohol. And off they go on holiday, right? He doesn't drink when he's on holiday. But she, because she's on holiday, starts to unwind a little bit and has a glass of wine. Etc. 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 For each night, for the two nights that they're on ho- the, the two weeks that they're on holiday, and then they come back from holiday, and of course he gets right back into the bevy again, and she's like, that, "Right, that's it with the drink." I've asked you, you need to get some help about it. He's like that. You, you, she's like, "You're an alcoholic." He's like that. I'm not the alcoholic. I've just been on holiday for two weeks. I never touched a drop. Did you see me touching a drop of alcohol for the two weeks? In fact, who was it that was drinking every night while we were on holiday? Right? And threw that back onto her and then that was like gaslighting and she's like, oh, right, aye, right, enough. So he was, he wasn't drinking when he was on holiday. Now, when we start to look at the compulsions of the mind of someone that's suffering from compulsions, right? Um, these are the kind of things that you think. This is what we think. You know, oh, well, I can stop it. I can stop it at any time, right? I can stop this at any time. So I've not got a problem with it. Uh, you know, I'm only having a glass of wine each night. Etc. 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 Now, as I'm admitting, sometimes I don't think I was an alcoholic. Sometimes I think I was an alcoholic. Sometimes I don't think I was an alcoholic. Fourteen years I've not a drink for, right? And I still go through that in my mind. But one hundred and ten percent, what I know is I was almost allergic to alcohol because it changed me. Now, in fourteen years of me being off alcohol. There has been three times where alcohol has passed my lips accidentally. I've not went out and purchased the alcohol. First time I was in a restaurant, somebody handed me a cherry off their dessert. Do you want that cherry? I'm like, I gaze it. Greedy Ross, gaze a cherry. Right, and the cherry had been soaked in alcohol. Threw it into my mouth. It had no longer hurt my tongue. And I felt my brain chemistry change. Ding! It was like a leprechaun. It's like this little jack in the box came out, right? So, bit ditched that. <laughs> Spitting out. I was like, picking alcohol in that, right? Ra, ra, ra. Second time, I was at my friend's wedding down south. Um, everybody had been handed a glass of champagne very quickly. You know, it was like it started raining inside, so the, the speech. So everybody was disorientated. We're running inside to do the speech. Somebody hands me a glass of champagne. I'm toasting them with a glass of champagne. And I'm kidding on. I'm kidding on I'm going to take a drink of it. I was never going to take a drink of it. And somebody bumped into me at the back. Again, tiny little amount of champagne went into my lips. And... Um, and boom, same thing again, felt my brain chemistry change. Jink, instantly leprechaun out the box. Whoa, what, 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 what carnage can I get involved in, right? With a minuscule amount of alcohol, right? Third time, was, it was in about the last year. Uh, normally when, I, um, when, I'm, when I'm at a church and we're doing the bread and wine deal, it's grape juice in my church, so it's cool. I know what I'm getting, I've asked, is this grape juice? Yep, yep, it's cool, I can do that. I can do the whole bread and wine thing. But I was at a service... Uh, I was at a service at Presbytery. Man, did I hit, did I hit an area of rage after that? Um, and I'm sitting in the da 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 da, Mr. Innocent, thimble full of wine over my neck. Now that's the most amount of alcohol that's passed my lips in 14 years. One of those little bloody cups, right? Oh man! And at which point, although I dipped myself in and out of fellowship, I went and saw a sponsor for 20 fucking five years ago and told him he's like, Ross, let yourself off the hook. You never went out on purpose to buy it. It was an accident, right? You know, it's done. But see that thimble full of wine? Brain chemistry changed, face heated up, anxiety, blah, 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 right? So, I know 100%... I don't need to rethink my drinking. Sometimes I might think I'm an alcoholic. Sometimes I might not accept I'm an alcoholic. But what I have 100% accepted, 100% I've been on my knees and I have given that over is that I cannot drink with safety. I cannot drink with safety because I do not know, I have no control what Jack is going to come out of the box. Choose not to do it. Now, are you rethinking your drinking? We've came out of lockdown. A lot of people have been battering the drink, right? And I'm not saying that with any judgment. I get it. Um, you've had to go quiet. You've had to go still. You've had to go inside yourself, be with yourself, place that you've hardly ever inhabited because you've been distracting yourself with all the finer things in life. 
and uh, distracting yourself from your unhappiness, etc. with job, work, blah, blah, blah. Now, for me, what can I impart with you that may be helpful? Now, I'm getting away with talking about this stuff a wee bit more now because it's becoming trendy, but you have no idea the flack that I've took in fellowship meetings, right? Because of the way I think. Because it's no part of the programme. Right? It's like, okay, I get that you're completely identified with the fellowship, right? And you all have to continually tell your freaking war stories, right? I get that vibe, man, and I'm not challenging you on that. So please don't challenge me on mine. I have a runner coming. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Hope you're well. Have a good day. Now, we, if we are in the clutches of addiction, it would be greatly helpful for us to start to nourish our nervous system. Well, what is our nervous system? Our nervous system, very simply put, is our parasympathetic and sympathetic limbic system. One is gas on, one is gas off. One is fight or flight and freeze. One is rest and digest and chill right out, right? That's the way it works. Now, it doesn't matter why you came to have a dysfunctional nervous system. We could spend years looking down the rabbit hole of that. Let's just do our wee bit of best to accept that our nervous system may be slightly dysfunctional. Now, what I began to look at, which was 2010, so I was four years into sobriety, when I started to get an understanding of neuroscience, when I went to America and trained with Martin Wittke, looking at quantitative EEGs, quantitative electrocynophonographs, and that's when I started to look at my brain. I started to look at the engine that was running the show. Now, there are three predominant neurotransmitters that we really have to address when we are working with addiction, right? Um, they are GABA. Now, GABA, G-A-B-B-A, -B -B -A, GABA is not a Dutch techno throbbing music that came out of Holland in the early 90s. GABA is a neurotransmitter. Serotonin and dopamine. Now, GABA, when we are low in GABA, we will feel anxious, okay? And we will worry a lot. We would, we would worry about the littlest things and we would obsess and we would probably have sort of compulsive ruminating thoughts, okay? That's GABA. Then we move on to serotonin. Serotonin is the antidepressant ne uh, neurotran neurotransmitter, right? So if we're low in serotonin, we would be low in mood, okay? And we would possibly be craving things like carbohydrates, sugars, salts, and we would possibly have difficulty sleeping, right? Then we've got dopamine. Dopamine is our reward and pleasure pathway predominantly set up with procreation and moving forward in survival in a lot of ways. Okay, if we're low in dopamine, we would find it pretty difficult to stay on target with our goals and um, we would find it difficult to have structure in our lives, right? So, what one do you think I was predominantly low in? I was low in most of them, right? But what one do you think that I was excruciatingly low in? I'm only giving you a minute to think about that because I'm completely and utterly knackered coming up that hill there, right? I was really low in, in GABA. I suffered from undiagnosed anxiety. It took me a long, long time to realise how anxious I was, but I never knew how anxious I was because I'd been anxious all my life. Um, it's like asking a fish about water, asking me about anxiety. No, I'm not anxious, right? I don't feel anxious. Of course I didn't feel anxious because that was my normal, right? So GABA was my transmitter that I was really low in. Ruminate, fucking obsessive. Obsessive, somebody parked their car outside my house, I wouldn't let it go. You know what I mean? I was thinking about it, 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 ruminating, 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 and I was lost. I was lost in a loop of rumination. Now, if you're low in GABA, right, and you're a drinker, okay, you would say that you're using alcohol to relax, right? If you're low in serotonin and you're a drinker, you would say that you use alcohol to have a good time. If you're low in dopamine, you would use alcohol and say that you used alcohol because it helps me connect, connect, okay? So dopamine, low dopamine. I've gave you the reasons of how that would be. 
and you would possibly be using alcohol to say, you know, I have real difficulty connecting in social situations, so I'd use alcohol just to get me to connect a wee bit. If you're low in serotonin, it's to have a good time, it's to party. Can I let my hair down unless I've had a couple of shandies? Right, that could be something to do with serotonin. And for GABA, it's definitely that feeling where you're taking your tie off at the end of the night, undoing that top button, and it helps you to relax, and it helps you to stop obsessing. So... Ross, he was Mr. Anxiety. Ross is definitely 100% Mr. Anxiety, or was. And also, um, when I used alcohol, I used that to release me from the compulsions of my thinking, my overthinking, my analysing and ruminating. And um, that would make me feel as if I was relaxing. Right? So, are you rethinking your drinking? And do you need to hit rock bottom do we need to ha hit rock bottom before we start to manage our drinking? Do we need to wait for the car to get towed out the drive with the, with the finance company, the wife and Wednesday have left us? Why do we need to wait until things get so bad before we start to manage our alcoholism, right? Now, we are part of, we've got more evidence and more scientific evidence available to us today than we did in the last decade or certainly in the last 20 years. There's a wellness movement going on around about health and wealth right now. And we now know what alcohol does to us. Bloody hell, it's legal and it's worse for you than a lot of illegal substances, right? It costs our economy more than it brings in. It's just absolutely nuts. It shrinks our brain. It fucking destroyed families and lives and traumas and, you know, half of the ACE movements, you know, adverse childhood experiences coming out of the East End of Glasgow was mostly traumatised because of the amount of drink that was involved. Now, rethinking your drinking... Now, what I would encourage you to do, and I've been blabbing on for ages, haven't I? I use trees as a point to kind of milestone how long I've been talking for. Because um, I just get right into stuff when I start talking about it. Obsessed, don't I? Now, laughing and joking aside. Now, I was talking about me there. You know, I got involved in quantitative electrocyne phonographs in 2010. It took me... One, two... The first electrocenophonograph was with Martin Wittke in 2010. The second one was with Dr. Thomas Kalura, the inventor and uh, marketer of Brainmaster Technologies in the United States. Huge um, stuff. And the third was with Dr. Antonio Marawa. He was on my vlogs, right? And he comes over and he's like, ah, Ross, do you feel anxious? No. Ross, you're like in a fucking hyper-vigilant state all the time, right? But the one that got me was when Dr. Thomas Kalur at a neuroscience conference in uh, Den Holland, Holland or Denmark, can't even mind, but 2011. And he just looked at my EEG, he looked at my brain, he looked at my electrocynophonograph, and he was quantitative, of course, and he looked at it and he went, do you smoke marijuana? And I went, no, funny you asked that, though because it was my drug of choice. And he went, mm, you would. You would have an innate compulsion towards marijuana because of the way your brain um, is. And I went, and how is my brain? And he went, well, you've got really high states of beta and you've got very little alpha. And marijuana, of course, gives us the sensation, the illusion of, of alpha. So, of course, I would have been unconsciously driven towards any kind of activity that would ignite my parasympathetic limbic system to get my brain to switch off because my brain's high beta which is like it's full of caffeine all the time right it's just like red bull central in there so it's not really helpful for me to drink coffee and certainly wouldn't drink red bull anyway but um that that's not helpful for me anyway that's kind of diversing off a little bit just to get you to think about your drinking and maybe what's underlying with it and, um, you know, there's a grey area drinking. There's this white line drinking for people where they go, they go well, but I can stop drinking for three days or three months or 30 days. And then, and then I go, hey, you know, I can do that. I can be a social drinker. And then they start off with a glass of wine again. And then before very, very, very long, it's up at a bottle of wine again. Now, I'm there right now. Um, like, I've just done that 80 miles, right? I'm just done that 80 miles and I don't sleep massive amounts. I'm up at five o'clock every morning. I go to my bed around 10. I never ever sleep during the day. See, Monday when I get down the road, 
came and done my vlog, stupid, should have had a day off, right, don't know how to do that, don't know how to switch gear and slow down a bit, right, and um, I went to bed at half past nine in the morning on Monday and fell asleep till half past twelve, I went to my bed at twenty past seven on Monday night and slept right through to five o'clock in the morning, the other thing I've noticed is I'm craving carbohydrates, now I'm tuning into my body and going what was it about that experience that's maybe reduced my serotonin right now. Is my serotonin slightly low? My dopamine is through the roof, right? I know that for a fact. My dopamine is flying right now. Um, so that's cool. Um, my GABA, my GABA's good, right? GABA is one that I'm able to identify very quickly because the second I start to over, like, reread text messages right or or he's really meaning that or he said that and then I start to get myself a wee bit ratty or upset about it that's when I know my gab is off so okay quickly before I finish this up what are the ways that we can start to um to uh, nourish ourselves in a different way right scouting about the company that I'm starting it's all based on this stuff what is one of the best things to increase your neurotransmitters right one of the best things to increase your neurotransmitters is nature, green space, and wait for it, water. Being around water, being around nature, and all you really need is 20 minutes, right? So I waited until I got to there. Green space, water, hearing that water, trees right so when we're having to increase if you've fallen in and you're thinking you know what he might have some sense in that because see there's not really a whole lot of folk in the fellowship talking about neurotransmitters they're just continually telling their war stories about when they stole out the shop and they come in pushed that night and pushed the bed and set the house on fire when they were making toast right it's like how many more times do you need to tell it right okay maybe your neurotransmitters are low What's the way to effectively manage your neurotransmitters? So first, nature. Giving yourself at least 20 minutes in nature every day. So because I'm really greedy, I do two hours, right? This is two hours I'm on this hike every day. Why? Because it keeps me on top. It keeps me from ruminating. It keeps me from feeling angry. It keeps me from obsessing. It keeps me from, yeah, I'm good. Life's good, right? And when I'm up, my relationships are up. It's almost like I attract people in a similar vibration and I don't need to go into relationships where people think they're better than me or if I do, I'm just like, ah, I'm done. Turn around about and walk out because you can see it. You don't get caught in it the same, right? Nature, breathing, regulate your breath. Hardest thing, hardest thing to do. And when I was training in breath work, to be completely honest with you, gaffer tape, you know that black tape? I used to put it over my mouth. It was so, or over here, black tape over my mouth scarf over my face so nobody would see me and I would just breathe through my nose and I used to do that for exactly 20 minutes every day until I could no longer because you want you automatically want to breathe through your mouth right so training so as I walk before I come on this vlog I'm just walking in nature I allow myself to completely tune in it's almost like I have a slightly altered state of consciousness because I'm focusing only on my breath and I'm looking at the trees and that's really helpful as well. And foods, when we're looking at carbohydrates, we're looking at leafy greens, we're looking at omega-3s, we're looking at all that kind of stuff. So when you're on your journey of sobriety, yes, you need the 12 steps. I am a total 12 stepper through and through, right? There are things about it that I don't agree with. The 12 steps, I've studied the science of the 12 steps, right? And I'm happy to share that with you, but unfortunately you will need to pay for that, right? So if you did want to know the science of the 12 steps, Right, I've shared some of it for free um, in these blogs earlier on, but um, yeah, I value, I really value the amount of time and effort and um, the interviewing with, um, oh God, world-class delivery people of the 12-step process and looking at the fundamentals at it from a scientific perspective. And that took me a massive amount of work and that's something that I don't give away for free. That's something that I do value. And if you do want part of that, Sorry, there's a cost to that. Um, 12 steps is fantastic. But if, look, let's put it this way. When I got, first started my journey in recovery, right, it was 1993, 27th of April, 1993, I walked in at my first fellowship meeting. There wasn't a Narcotics Anonymous back then, guys. There wasn't a Cocaine Anonymous back then, guys. There was the Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, 
I never had a problem with drink. I just used to drink water, but I used to take handfuls of Eckies and um, speed and for a Thursday to a Sunday, right? I mean, I didn't really know very much about that, so it was alcohol. So I just used to talk shit and say, you know, I've got a problem with drinking, that's why I'm here and all the rest of it, right? But wasn't it? It was a whole con- cocktail of, Molotov cocktail of um, chemicals. And um, do you know what the guy gave me? You know what the dude gave me? Here, big man, any time you get a pang, take that. Gave me a three-pack of Mars bars. All right, no problem, right? That's nutritional. Um, that's nutrition's. So when we're dealing with our compulsions and our addictions, it's not just a one-shoe model. You will not get better if you're going to AA meetings and on the way there, you have a haggis supper, right? You're drinking massive amounts of Kunsel coffee, not good quality ground roast beans, right? You're eating, drinking, you're putting sugar in it, right? You're not going to get any better. Why? Because that's attacking your gut. See those neurotransmitters that I spoke about? GABA, serotonin, um, dopamine, where are they made? They're made in your stomach, right? They're made in your gut. So if you're pouring sugar, caffeine, milk, all the crap of the day into your stomach, right? You're still munching biscuits like they're going out of fashion. You're still aggressive. You're still not making your bed in the morning. You're going to an AA meeting. Your levels of success are going to be maybe achievable, but really bloody hard to keep up. And last of all, you may not get success. So that's... um, that's my wee rabble from this morning, uh, rambles from the South Lanarkshire countryside. And um, I hope that if you are rethinking your drinking and um, it is something that you're thinking about, you're not alone. Um, you're not alone. It's, uh, as I said, there's still days where I think I'm an alcoholic or was I no an alcoholic, was I an alcoholic, was I no an alcoholic. And, you know, it's a horrible word. I get that. Sometimes I think I was, sometimes I think I wasn't, right? But bottom line, 100% I accepted. I did not know who I was going to be when I took the lid off that bottle of whiskey, right? I didn't know if I was going to be the good guy or the bad guy, right? I didn't know if I was going to be the happiest guy in the house or the most destructive guy in the house. So I came to accept that I can no longer drink with safety and that's enough for me. And I will never, as long as I live in Folk Nail, go, yeah, you can't say that. I know that. I have been through hell in the last five years and I split up in a relationship with an extremely uh, toxic set of variables of which I was part of, right? It takes two to tango. And for folk that think that it's only one to blame, yous are daft. It takes two to tango. And there's always two sides to the story and then there's the truth. But the folk that want to buy into one side singular stories, well bless them, God bless them actually I pray for the people, I genuinely do actually they're on my prayer table now heal deal and find a layer of success because I know that I will no longer go back to drinking because I value more than anything the life that I've got today the gratitude that I feel I have got friends now Right, I have actually got people that I would call my friends for the majority of my life, all I've ever had is acquaintances. People that used me and folk that I used. People that um, would have a purpose for me and of course I was only ever a purpose for them. Now, the people that are in my life now are friends. Um, I value them. And there is a common mutual ground where we respect one another and give freely. Now, I would encourage you to rethink your drinking. How long has it went on? We live in a culture in the west of Scotland where, you know, it's the only addiction, if you like, that when you give it up, it's judged, right? And um, I hope that's helpful, right? I could rabble on about this stuff for forever, as you, as you can hear. This is my passion. My passion is... Uh, is uh, is being a conduit, conduit for people to live in the light, you know. Um, you might catch some flack for it. Uh, you know, crikey, when I gave up the drugs and the alcohol, everybody was like, oh, he's a born-again Christian. At that point, I wasn't. I only started following the Word of Christ in 2010, which is quite funny. Um, but you'll take some flack for it. But do you know what? See, at the end of the day, wholeheartedly take it for me. I've got some wonderful things in my life. Um... I really have, and I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have any of what I've got in my life right now 
if I had not dealt with what it was that I needed to deal with and I absolutely know that you guys can do the same so rethink your drinking choose health choose happiness um, I wish you all the very best and have a great day wishing you well from New Lanark look at that and that's stunning look at that take it easy have a good one